Good evening. Welcome to eCourse Community Bible Church Bible Study. We're in the book of Revelation, and uh, we just had fellowship, uh, prayer time, and we had uh, worship. It was a great time fellowship. Wish you could be with us. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, are still concerned about uh, the pandemic, and, and uh, uh, we understand that. Totally understand that. Uh, we do have our uh, mask. We try uh, to be sensitive, sensitive especially uh, for some who are very concerned and uh, maybe because of our age or because of an illness. So, but uh, what a wonderful thing to see those that have turned out and then for the Bible study tonight and then the fact that you can tune in on YouTube and on Facebook. And uh, we're going to continue on in our study from uh, Revel uh, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Let's bow our heads and open in prayer. Gracious and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be here this evening. We ask your blessing on this study. Help us in understanding the word uh, about uh, the church, the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3. Pray, Holy Spirit, that you be the teacher. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, we also, if you have a question, you can raise your hand. We have uh, 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 our friends sitting at tables here with your pencils. Uh, also some booklets that uh, Rhonda brought last time that are available so that you can take notes. And uh, I want to start immediately uh, by mentioning the uh, seven churches of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. Uh, if you're tuning in for the first time, we passed out these maps. We have these maps on the table in the back. And it's the seven churches that Jesus Christ is speaking about. There were actually hundreds of churches. Some of these, Paul the Apostle started, and uh, others, uh, some of the other apostles. And, um, so we're going to be talking about these particular seven churches, which make up modern-day Turkey geographically. All right, and uh, the first is the, the Cold Orthodox Church. The Cold Orthodox Church. That's the church at Ephesus. Oh, they had the Orthodox, but their hearts were cold. The second is Smyrna, and that's the church suffering persecution. And I want you to think about this second church. <laughs> Actually, we need to think about... Um, all of them, don't we? But I want you to think about this second church just for a second. It's the suffering church. It's the church that's persecuted. Uh, for the first time in our lifetime, we are seeing in America parts of the country where, church, where the church is being persecuted. Being persecuted. $50,000 a week. Uh, one particular Baptist church in uh, California being fined for meeting just as we are here in this country, even though the Constitution uh, gives us this privilege here in Michigan. Uh, persecution. Are you ready? Are you, will you stand? And I, I, think it's, I think it's a good time for us to be studying this. Uh, number three is the Church of Pergamos. It's the church married to the world. Imagine that. Uh, they're living a worldly life. That's what they're living for. Uh, number four is the church at Thyatira, and that's the church tolerating sin. You know, uh, it's okay, uh, even though God is holy, even though we're living in a, uh, an environment, uh, uh, or at least the church is supposed to be an environment of holiness, uh, uh, sin going on, just sin, tolerating sin. Can you imagine that? Is that possible in a church today? Oh, you better believe it. You better believe it. Um... And then you have number five is Sardis, and this is the dead church. It's a church that's meeting, but there isn't any uh, uh, real spiritual life in it. Uh, there are churches today that just go through the uh, uh, ceremony, and they're dead. And that's the church at Sardis. Then the sixth church is the faithful church. Oh, to belong to the faithful church. This is the church at Philadelphia. This is the church that God says, I will keep you from the hour of trial uh, that will come upon the whole earth. It's coming. It's coming. Be here this Friday at our prayer meeting. We're showing uh, the video 
uh, or, uh, uh, or, or study what's next for planet Earth. And we're going to be looking at the scriptures. Um, the faithful church, get ready for the rapture. Get ready, true believers. And then number seven is the apostate church. And this is the church where Christ is on the outside. Uh, uh, Revelation chapter 3, uh, 19 and 20. Um, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. He's still speaking to the church at Philadelphia, even though it's uh, compromised. It's lukewarm. Christ is on the outside of that church. Okay. Uh, so these were and are real churches, which represent all churches of history as well, including the uh, churches in, in which we live today. Now, let's uh, get right into it in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. And by the way, along the way, if you have a question, then you can raise your hand and uh, I'll, re I'll repeat your question if it's, if, if it's uh, not audible. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Remember what uh, the Bible said about the seven stars and the seven golden candlesticks? In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 20, it said the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, the messengers of the seven churches. And then it says, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest, they are the seven churches. And notice, it says, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, walketh in the midst of the seven candlesticks. That means that, and we said this before, is that Christ walks in the midst of the church. Please uh, remember this. If this church has the light on, then Christ is present. Christ is in our midst. In our prayer time, thank you for those that were in sincere prayer. Uh, that was spirit-led prayer. And Christ is in our midst. He's listening to our prayers. We're coming before the throne. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 and 16. Uh, Let us come therefore boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How dare we come boldly before God, except that we have a Savior who took our place. And now, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he, God, made him Christ who knew no sin to become my sin, that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. I can come before the throne, but first I've got to confess my sin. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to wash us, to cleanse us. If you're in this church, you're not going to be happy living in sin. If you're in a church where the light is on, you're not going to be happy living in sin. And by the way, Christians can still sin. Um, in verse, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, First John 1, uh, it says, uh, one nine, if we confess our sins, but in First John one eight, it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. First John one eight, we still sin, but we have to confess that sin. Okay, we don't live in sin. That's the difference. Uh, verse two, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars how many false prophets in the world today oh my goodness it's horrible and so this was the church at ephesus and god is telling them that he's applauding them these are commendations that they cannot uh, stand them which say they are uh, ministers of god and are not and has found them to be what liars all right uh, this was the church at ephesus and you hast borne and hast patience, and for my sake hast labored and hast not fainted. It's so easy to faint, isn't it? We're, we're seeing a good group here tonight as I'm looking out. You know, on a Wednesday night, we could be doing anything, but I think that we're, we're feeling that, wait a minute, if I'm a Christian, I need to hear 
the word of God. And if the light is on at this church, we are hearing the word of God. Amen. Amen. And, and so it's, thou hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, and this hurts. This, the next part of the, if I belong to this church at Ephesus, and I heard him say this, this would hurt me bad, because thou hast left thy first love. This is Jesus speaking to them. This is also Jesus speaking to the church today. Amen. Have you left your first love? Always remember that. And this is the first order of the churches that Jesus is speaking to. Uh, and what does he tell that church to do? Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. Um, else I will come quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent. And of course the church at Ephesus is not there today. It's just uh, the city is all in uh, rubble. And uh, uh, today that the, the light in that church is out. Okay, uh, it could happen in any church, can it? Verse number uh, six, but this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And uh, uh, it was two things mainly. It was the, the Nicolaitans uh, were guilty of uh, uh, encouraging and living in fornication, okay, sexual uh, activity apart from marriage. And that includes everything. We're not, we're not gonna pick a category. You don't have to pick a category. Fornication. Okay, somebody says, well, I'm not doing this, you know. I'm, yeah, well, what fornication are you doing? And so that was the Nicolaitans, also idolatry. And somebody says, well, my goodness, I'm not, I'm not involved in idolatry. Idols, wait a minute. Anything that takes the place in your life that God deserves is an idol. Is an idol. And uh, so, anyways... He says, but thou hast that, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And then Jesus says, I hate them too. Now, verse seven says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear uh, what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay, the Spirit is speaking every time that you open the word of God. And if you have a church that has the light on, the Spirit is speaking. We pray that the Spirit is the teacher. You. You have an unction from the Holy One, 1 John chapter 2. And the Holy One is the Holy Spirit, and the unction is an anointing. And the Holy, you have no need that any man teach you, because you have the Holy Spirit. Uh, and to him that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And this next part right here I think is important. Because we haven't left the church of... Uh, uh, Ephesus yet, but I want you to listen to this and be, uh, be careful as you listen. It says, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now we're all uh, in memory of the tree of life uh, that was in the midst of uh, the paradise in the garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But I think it's interesting that Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, are you listening? To him that overcometh, you get to eat of this tree. To him that overcometh. Do you want to sit back? Do you want to uh, ease on down the road? And you know, when uh, uh, you have the opportunities to be a witness for Christ, to sit back? Keep our mouths closed? Do you want to cave in when it's an opportunity to share the gospel? Or do you want to cave in when somebody comes up to you and says, are you a Christian? And you keep your mouth closed because of persecution. Listen, persecution's coming. We said the next church that we're going to be looking at is the church at Sperna. They're the persecuted church. And, and as I was studying this, are you listening? Persecution is here in some of the states. And this present state, our present authority or political management uh, is having a fit because the church of Jesus Christ gets to meet. Having a fit because we get to meet. Well, what does Ephesians chapter 6 and verse uh, 10 and following say to us, Don? It says, Don's in the back there. 
Uh, it says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, spiritual wickedness in high places, put on the full armor of God. So actually what we're up against is we're up against Satan, but he's just using uh, figures, uh, individuals, many politicians. Yeah. But to him that overcometh, I want to uh, go through a couple of these verses on those who are overcomers. And what does it mean to be an overcomer? Because you're not going to heaven unless you're an overcomer. Now this says you're not eating the tree of life if you're not an overcomer. He says this. Jesus says this to the church at Ephesus. Unless you're an overcomer, you're not eating of this tree of life. I hope we know what the tree of life is. It sustains life throughout eternity in heaven. Revelation uh, 21 and 22. Which is going to be there. On both sides of the river of, of, of life, crystal river of life that proceeds from the throne will be the tree of life on both sides uh, as, as long as the, the river flows. Okay, we're not going to talk about that yet. Uh, 1 John 5, 4, Whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. Are you born of God? That's what Nicodemus asked Christ. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He says, you must be born of God. You must be born again. He didn't say, oh, you got to get down, on, get on your knees and just say, I'm right here. Jesus, come into my heart. Jesus could have told him right there, but he didn't. He said, Nicodemus, you have to be born again from above. Yes. How do you get born again? How do you get born again? And this is going to be um, uh, brief because we could go into great detail, but that's a good question. Um, she asked, how do you get born again? And uh, we have on our uh, bulletin uh, that we pass out every week, we have out uh, the elements of the gospel. And uh, you don't need to get one. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. But I'm just going to say this very quickly if you're listening in because this is important. How do you get born again? And um, uh, it starts with, the Word of God, the Word of God has to be preached. Mm -hmm. And in Romans chapter 3 and uh, 14, it says, how can they believe unless they hear? And how can they hear unless somebody be sent? Romans chapter 3 and verse 14. And so how's somebody gonna, gonna believe unless somebody opens their mouth and shares the gospel? Do you have a track on you right now in your purse and your wallet? Somebody's saying, yes, I do. Uh, are you ready if somebody outside or somebody else comes along and you have an opportunity? Maybe God's leading that person to you. You don't know. And so you've got to open up with the Word of God. And then uh, uh, secondly, uh, the Gospel is something that uh, every one of us should understand. Is Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 through 4, what does he say? I delivered unto you that which I first received, so Paul says, what I'm giving you is the same thing that I receive. How that Christ died on the cross. And who's Christ? Very important we get that right. Because the Christ that is preached in many churches today uh, is not based on the scriptures. It's not the Christ of the Bible. Even though they'll point out the scriptures. Who is Christ? Christ is the Son of God. The Son of the living God. Period. And uh, he became a man, uh, we celebrate at Christmas time, we're familiar with that, as, as, as of the virgin birth in, in Mary without sin, uh, by the Holy Spirit. And uh, he came and he lived a perfect life, and then he died at Calvary. And Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 said that when Adam fell, that God would provide a redeemer. And... Uh, 2,000 years later, his own son came and took on flesh and was incarnate because he loved you and because he loved me. And then he lived the perfect life. He went to the cross. The Bible tells us, are you listening? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. Christ died on the cross. He was the spotless lamb of God. The Bible says, behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And he took your place and my place and he died on the tree, the cross, 
He shed his precious blood, he died and he rose again. Again, I complete uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Paul says, but I delivered unto you that which I first received, how that Christ died on the cross for my sins, according to the scripture. And on the third day, he arose again from the dead, according to the scripture. And that's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And that the Bible tells us very clearly that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so therefore, none of us are righteous. And in fact, the Bible says our righteous acts are filthy before the Lord, Isaiah repeats. And so we are lost and in need of uh, a savior. And Jesus is that savior. And uh, uh, God's Holy Spirit must bring the conviction uh, once we hear the good news, and you've just heard the good news, God's Holy Spirit must bring conviction into our heart, a conviction that causes us to cry out to God, brings a broken heart that he grants repentance. It's not something we can even produce. It's something the Holy Spirit brings conviction into our heart, and into our life. And when he brings that conviction into our life, now it's between you and him. It's not between you and me and him. It's not between you and the evangelist and him, it's between you and him. And so you must consider what you have heard and your need. Because apart from that, whosoever's name is not found written in the book of life will be cast in the lake of fire. And then uh, uh, Revelation 20, 11 through 15, uh, there's a great white throne judgment. And uh, so if we have a broken heart, if we recognize our sin, then we, God brings repentance into our life. And after we repent, we need to be willing to, Jesus Christ says, to die. Because that's what happens. You cannot enter eternal life. You cannot become a Christian except that you die. Die to this world. You die to sin. You die to Satan. You die to yourself. In the Bible, Jesus says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And so you've got to decide, is that what I want? Do I want to live for the kingdom of God? Do I want to live for Christ? Do I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior? And uh, one of my last verses, Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. The old I is dead in Christ. I'm crucified with Christ, the I and Adam that deserves the wrath of God for sin. Nevertheless, I live. It's still me. But now, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. A Christian must be transformed. A Christian must have the righteousness of Christ to enter heaven. And... Uh, 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is it, 1 John 5, 11 and 12. It says, this is the record that God has given to us, eternal life. And this life is what? It's in his son. He that has the son has life. He that has not the son of God has not life. John 3, 36 goes on to say, but the wrath of God abides on him. Do you know Christ? Have you been convicted by God's Holy Spirit that you're a sinner and that you're lost? Not that you know the answer is that do you have Christ as your Lord and Savior? And so people will leave uh, from here or in their hearts and contemplate and consider whether or not that they know Christ or not and that there's an eternal separation from God and hell. If a person doesn't uh, truly be born again by the Spirit of God. And uh, that's uh, something that we would pray that each one of us would consider in our hearts and minds. Have you done that? And get alone with God and talk to Him. And if you don't understand it, and if you don't, if you're not convicted, pray God give me conviction. Holy Spirit, bring me conviction. And by the way, you can come here to the church, you can call myself or a pastor and uh, talk things over, but you need to talk these things over with Jesus Christ. 
so that you can know you have eternal life. And on uh, Sunday, we're going to be continuing our study, which uh, is going to be in 1 John on what I've come up with, 15 evidences that you're saved. And if you don't have those evidences in your life, you're not saved. And one of them, are you walking in the light or are you walking in darkness? If you're walking in dark, if you're walking in sin, you're living in sin. You're not saved, John says clearly. If you're walking in light, then the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from your sin. 1 John chapter 1. All right. Um, quickly, um, I want to at least mention a few more verses because this ties in with what's happening here at the church at Ephesus. And this is true of every church. I hope, listen, don't, aren't you glad that God brings chastisement and conviction into the hearts of his children because he loves them? Absolutely. Oh, we love God if, if we sin and step out of line and, 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 and we have a, 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 a non-caring attitude, then we're not his. So, anyways, uh, we'll be d discussing that on uh, Sunday. Whatsoever is born of God, 1 John 5, 4, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Listen, we overcome the world by trusting God. True faith. Okay? 1 John 5, 4. Let me give you a couple more verses. John 16, 33. These things have I spoken unto you that you might have peace. You can have peace. Contentment. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be a good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know why we overcome the world? You know why we can have confidence? Because he overcame the world. That's exactly what he's saying. Um, Romans 8, 37. Nay, in all these things we are what? More than conquerors. How? Through him. That loved us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We overcome through Christ. First John 5, 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. All true believers are what? Overcomers. Uh, a couple more verses. That was 1 John 5, 5. 1 John 4, 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that what? is in you than what? He that is of the world. Because you overcome. How can you overcome? One reason, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We see another portion in Revelation 3 and 21. And it says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcome and am set down with my Father in his throne. Listen to this. That's Revelation 3.21. Are you listening? Yes, yes. Overcomers will sit with Christ at his throne. Only overcomers will sit with Christ at his throne. Oh, such cheap grace that we have today that people who think that, oh my goodness, I prayed a happy little prayer and somebody told me I was saved and my life didn't change. And I'm not living for Christ, and I don't give to Christ, and I don't, I'm not convicted about sin. And I'm living for myself, and I'm living for the world, but I'm saved because I prayed a little prayer. Jesus, come into my heart. Cheap grace. Yes, we need to pray for Jesus to come into our heart. But the Holy Spirit has to be involved. And then the evidence is overcoming. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and I sat down with my Father in his throne. Overcomers will sit with Christ. Overcomers will sit at the throne of God. Overcomers only. Um, Revelation 3 and 5, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before the Father and his angels. Overcomers confess Christ on earth. Christ confesses us in heaven. Are you an overcomer? Are you listening? Are you an overcomer? 
If you're saved, genuinely saved, then because greater is he that's in you, and the Bible says he will accomplish it through you. That's how we can overcome. All right, uh, because of the time, we're going to have to close, except I want to close with that verse again. He that hath an ear uh, to, to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh. It's not like, oh, this is a person who goes above, above and beyond. Oh, this is somebody that's a, a, a disciple or, a, or, or an apostle. This is somebody who is a, uh, somebody who is a, 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 a witness for, for Christ. Uh, those are the ones that get these special rewards. No. This is the uh, child of God that's born again by the Spirit of God. You must be born again. Though This is the child of God that's born again that is the overcomer. And it says, I'll give to him to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the garden of Eden. And we're going to be talking about that next time. The tree of life. What is the tree of life? And it says we'll be able to partake of this tree of life. What do we need the tree of life for? The Bible says in the book of uh, Revelation uh, 21 and 22 about this tree. It says that uh, uh, the nations of the world will come in that day uh, to partake of the tree of life. The nations of the world? The nations of the world? To partake of the tree of life? What does it mean? That's interesting. We're going to look at that next time. And it says overcomers will be able to partake of the tree of life. Looking forward to that. Let's see. There's so much more to say about the tree of life. We're going to talk about that next time. Let's pray. Gracious Father, this thing called Christianity is not uh, filling pews at a church. It's not singing songs and, and, and uh, 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 even quoting verses or ceremony. Seraphony. Uh, it's knowing Jesus Christ. It's it's dying to this world. It's something that Jesus Christ says happens at Calvary as he died on the cross. We're on the cross with him. And Father, greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world if we're, if, if we're saved. And so we're living for the kingdom. We pray that if anyone here doesn't know or those listening in don't know you as Lord and Savior, then Father, that they will consider the claims of Christ, the Son of God, died at Calvary. He died at Calvary to save us from separation from God, eternal separation from God in, in the fires of hell so that we might have eternal life with him for the joy that was set before you, Lord Jesus, who endured the cross, despising the shame. And that joy was to see your saints in heaven. Saints, saints, holy ones in heaven. And so help us, gracious Father, that we might live for you Convict hearts, Lord, about salvation. And uh, Father, we thank you and praise you for our salvation through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.